let's go to William Kent, a very different kind of architect. The, the architect who brought Palladio to Great Britain. And I love Palladio, so I should look with uh, some care to William Kent as well. William Kent was not born on this day, he died on this day. William Kent, a very famous uh, architect in, in Great Britain, apparently he designed everything. He was admired for being a great designer. He designed gardens, he designed palaces, he designed uh, uh, furniture, objects, he designed everything, even a boat for the prince, and you are going to see it. Uh, this presentation also deserves to be uh, amplified. This man had a, a giant uh, oeuvre, he, he built a lot. So this is just an ad memoir for some of the things he did. He was the man <laughs> with red shoes, you know. Uh, Stephen Hall uh, has a strange taste for shoes. They are not red, but uh, they are distinctly different from the way he dresses otherwise. And also, of course, the, the frames, the glasses. But here is, uh, you know, uh, William Kent the successful architect uh, who, <laughs> who has a brush, I think, in his uh, right hand. Yeah, he was also a painter. I understood he was a mediocre painter. Uh, he started as a painter, but uh, he knew better later on. He became an architect, very, very successful, built a lot. And here is another picture of him, you know, the, the, the portrait of the architect as a young art, as, a, as an artist. Okay, so William Kent. Uh, so he lived about, uh, let's say, uh, when uh, when um, uh, when um, Antonio da Sangallo died. He died about 140 years before William Kent was born. So was an eminent English architect. You see, he died on the 12th of April. Landscape architect, painter, and furniture designer of the early 18th century. He began his career as a painter and became principal painter in ordinary or court painter, but his real talent was for design in various media. William Kent. Kent introduced the Palladian style of architecture into England with a villa at Chiswick House and also originated the so-called natural style of gardening known as the English landscape garden at Chiswick. Stowe House and Buckingham Buckinghamshire and Rusham House in Ox Oxfordshire. As a landscape gardener, he revolutionized the layout of his states, but had limited knowledge of horticulture. Here I would like to stop and say, how many of you, the students, design also the garden outside of the house you designed? This total disregard for what is outside of the house is not only natural, unnatural, but it's also uh, reductive and unproductive. It's very important to, 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 to think of, the, of, the, of, of what is happening outside of the house. And if it is a garden, all for the better. So maybe in one of your projects, could, you could start actually with a garden and then make the house to match the garden. He complements especially today, that is important because we need oxygen, we need to fight pollution, and we need green, green trees, grass, bushes, you name them, flowers. The Rust schools of architecture where they have a department of horticulture, like the School of Architecture in Cincinnati, in the United States, which is a very good school of architecture. They study, they have a department of horticulture. So, William Kent, he complemented his houses and gardens with stately furniture for major buildings, including Hampton Court Palace, Chiswick House, Devonshire House, and Russia. Some drawings by uh, William Kent. Sorry for the resolution. I mean, the drawings are, you know, romantic with uh, animals, a horse and lion, and a little house. And, you know, uh, you would say these are not the drawings of an architect. But as I said, he was a painter initially, and he kept painting actually again and again. The architect is an artist. Let's let's tell the truth. And if the architect is not an artist, then um, 
I don't think the architect is a very happy human being. It is in the connection with the art that, that architecture brings joy in the architect, I think. Not in the connection with the, with the codes and the rules and the regulations. No, you must be perverse to find exuberance and joy in reading the, the codes and the regulaments, uh, the, you know, the, the rules and regulations. No, no, they don't warm up the soul. Professors, they don't warm up the souls. They are needed, I guess, sometimes, but uh, they don't warm up the souls. And, uh, you know, plus they change. By the time you finish the school, they change. The government changes, the administration changes, you know, the, uh, these things change. Okay, sorry, the bad resolution. But here all of a sudden is a... <laughs> I don't even know if he did this, you know, maybe it was an engraving done after his drawings or uh, I don't know. No cars, no parking lots, no uh, malls, no highways, just uh, columns and some rather tired trees and two people talking about changing the, the world and the mad dog there. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, again, some drawings by uh, William Kent. This one does seem to be by him. Uh, and uh, because he was very interested in landscape, in landscape design, in gardens. And you'll see some examples of his work a little bit later. Uh, again, animals, dogs, you know, I, I guess there were animals then, you know, uh, like in our time in Bucharest, where at night, you know, you are in danger uh, if uh, on certain streets. There are dogs. I know. I know because once I came with a bus from Sibiu to Bucharest and I arrived in Bucharest at 5 a.m. and I said, let me walk all the way to Universidad. <laughs> and uh, I, I chose wrongly. I had to avoid some, uh, some ferocious dogs. It's not a joke with the dogs in Bucharest. All come home. A stern building, I mean, it's a difference between Palladio. Uh, sorry, Mr. Kent. I mean, you admire Palladio, but uh, this is much more stern than, than uh, what Palladio did. The cascade in gardens of Chiswick House. Uh, yeah, it is the informal British or English gardening. You know, you wouldn't see something like this in uh, André Le Notre or French gardening, but you see it in England. And I actually like it, the primitivism. Let nature be as she wants to be or it wants to be. Uh, otherwise, the water is guided, of course. Uh, but the, the stones are rough, so I guess it's okay. Now, he, he designed this for the prince, and I, I mentioned this, you know, he, he did this design. I don't know if it's maybe with a... With a, with a the textile material at the top would have been uh, nicer. Now, like this is kind of, I don't know. Plus, it's not on water. So, the Temple of Venus. They built a lot of temples. Something we don't do, but maybe we should do again. Temple of uh, Venus in Stowe. Again, rather stern for my taste, you know, and dark. And uh, and Venus is supposed to be, you know, the goddess of love, but. Uh, this doesn't inspire too much love in me when I look at it. It's uh, the temple of British worthies, interesting word, worthies. You know, look at them. The worthies, all dead, are here. Maybe, you know, uh, portraitures of uh, so called famous men. I'm sure only men, no women. Women are not considered uh, worthies, just men. Of course, look at them, how they are aligned here. It's kind of ridiculous, this temple, I think. Uh, plus, all these are dead, you know. I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyway, the temple of ancient virtue. Why is it ancient? Why shouldn't be also present? Um, what can we say? There, there was naivety then, too, of course. You know, the whole, whole, whole come whole north front, another large scale uh, palace. Uh, it's okay, this one, I think. It has, it's okay because it has various volumes which articulate with a certain 
feel for, for variety, it's okay. We move forward and, and this, this breaks the symmetry and uh, it's, it, it, this is okay. I think it's an okay work, uh, but still it's a long distance from Palladio. William Kent, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world, he is a Palladianist. Uh, marble hall, uh, what can we say? So different no, from what we saw with Antonio da Sangallo. Uh, different, you can tell this is not really, I mean, this cannot be in Italy, it's, it's not, it's not. Yes, there is ornamentation, yes, there is decoration, yes, there is a ceiling which is, you know, moderately impressive, but so different from uh, from the rooms we saw uh, embellished by, uh, by uh, Antonio da Sangallo. An obelisk, this one also is rather strange and, and, and uh, stern, you know, why, why do people, why did people love obelisks, even imported from Egypt, you know, like in uh, Place de la Concorde in Paris, that um, uh, Georges Bataille called that stupid or ridiculous obelisk because we want immortality of course we don't want to die we don't want to we want to last and an obelisk uh, seems to say you know the king is still alive when in fact the the king uh, is rotten you know is uh, uh, is not alive but the obelisk keeps the, the illusion somehow the triumphal arch you know who, is, who would build a triumphal arch these days nobody <laughs> We might have here and there triumphalist architectures, but no triumphal, triumphal arches. Now, this is a rather grayish and sad triumph. I think William Kent is a little bit, although he was a painter, but, but his buildings are a little bit too gray. Like this one as well. You know, it's uh, something is needed, maybe an exuberant Italian uh, to, to, to bring something to the buildings. The Webchester Lodge in Badminton House, again, gray, you know, gray, uh, gray and heavy, as stone is, but uh, anyway, it's just a gate. <laughs> Nobody lives there probably, although there is a room above. The Chiswick House, the gallery, um, he had a liking for these kind of ceilings, you know, uh, very elaborate. And look at the base for this table, you know, and uh, you'll see another one in detail. The dome of the saloon in the Chiswick House, rather pale, no? After we saw what the Italians were capable of doing with Antonio da Sangallo, uh, the, and the saloon again. <clears throat> Again, we, we see clearly the difference between Antonio da Sangallo, I mean, earlier, uh, and uh, what happens in, uh, in uh, you know, uh, Great Britain, uh, you know, one, 150 years later. It's, the, the aesthetics is, uh, are more uh, simplistic in a way and dry. The bedroom. Well, Yes, it has paintings and it has that uh, chair there, which is uh, ornate, but uh, otherwise, I don't know. Uh, Chiswick House table, look at this, a table. A table, uh, this could have been very much liked by ex-president Trump and uh, Mr. Becali in our country. Uh, gold, gold and gold again, expressing power no? and riches. Even Frank Lloyd Wright painted the walls of his waiting room at, in Oak Park, where he received prospective clients in gold to give the impression he was doing so well that the walls couldn't be otherwise but gold. The Chiswick House ceiling, a blue velvet room. Now, just imagine, you are making your project a house or a, yeah, with a blue velvet room. Why not? And look, look at the ceiling. It does look like a blue velvet uh, ceiling uh, somehow. But for this, you need painting and you need uh, tapestry and so on. 
Chiswick House Gardens. Nice. It's nice to do the gardens. That's why I keep suggesting. I know in six years of study, nobody will ask you to do a garden as if they don't matter, but they do matter. And especially these days, if we are serious about fighting off pollution and also fighting off boredom, aesthetical boredom, because a garden uh, brings uh, in different interests and uh, it's nice to have a nice garden uh, uh, near a nice house. It's nice to have a nice garden even near an, an ugly house, but uh, the nice garden uh, is, is something we shouldn't neglect. Strangely, I have seen many, many projects at the university. No one does the gardens, the landscapes. No, we just do the building and whatever happens around the house, it's okay. Maybe we design the highway a little bit and the entrance into the parking lot, but not the garden, no. No, never. Chiswick House Gardens, again, the gardens. Ah, here you don't see too much gardening. And yes, it's that little chapel there or whatever it is. And another obelisk, of course, a temple. It's called the temple at the Chiswick House. Um, what is a temple? It's a structure built uh, with some kind of a metaphysical or commemorative uh, uh, you know, meaning, you know, memorialize someone or an idea. We don't build temples any longer, although I think we should. Why not? Modern temples, a modern, a deconstructivist temple. Why not build a deconstructivist temple or an expressionistic temple? Uh, how other, again, the gardens, we saw the picture, but from the other side, um, we saw it. But is the nature beautiful? I mean, look around it. It's, it is beautiful. Uh, a cascade, another cascade, but I don't, I don't see the water here. Maybe something happened. Um, there is someone here on the grass. By the way of this, of this person on the grass, I strongly suggest to you, if you want to see a very, very, very nice movie, uh, uh, I recommend to you blow up by Michelangelo Antonioni. You can download it on, on, uh, on the internet. It's a great film, uh, uh, even has a, a, a crime story, uh, a love story, is erotical, is, is uh, an action film in, in, in London in the 60s. But it's done by a, by a great, uh, one of the great uh, film directors of all time, uh, Michelangelo Antonioni since we talked about Michelangelo. So please don't forget, blow up. This is the name of the film. And I'm sure you love it. It's a very, very fine film. Uh, and it's not excessively intellectual, no. It's a very interesting film. Blow up, B-L-O-W, a little line and then up, U-P. Uh, I don't know. Ah, I love this. I love this. I mean, this is the function of what you are going to see next. An eye catcher. <laughs> Please, you the students, make eye catchers in your projects. Just, just build a, an eye catcher. And if the professor asks you, what is this? You'll say, it's an eye catcher, professor. I was inspired by William Kent. Okay? Look at this. <laughs> its only function is to be an eye catcher. Can you believe it? I think we should build more eye catchers in the world. I really do. I think the more eye catchers we have in the world, the more interesting our world will be. An eye catcher. <laughs> yes, may, make an eye catcher. I don't know what that means. Pren, Neste, Rosham is again some kind of a memorial. I think I expect to see some portraits of famous men there and, and in the arches, another hall, uh, good architecture, but a little bit blunt and a little bit boring, but it, it's a good architecture. I mean, if by architecture we mean mainly construction and articulation of volumes, a temple, another temple, rather predictable and dry. I don't like it so much. Another temple, um, they built a lot of temples. Let, let us uh, let us tell the truth. Stone, 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 and trees, and centrality, and the dome. 
uh, house in London. Uh, this is a project. Uh, yes, human beings build houses. And so did uh, William Kent. The painted ceiling in Chiesa di San Giuliano dei Fiamingi, Fiamingi in Rome, the apotheosis of St. Julian from 1717. So the, he did a painting. William Ken did, did, paint, did the painting. But as I read, he was considered uh, maybe a posteriori, meaning after his life, um, after he died, uh, rather mediocre painter. Well, what can we say? At least it has colors. But uh, he probably designed also these golden things around, which are maybe more impressive than the painting. Okay, royal moose. Um, these are interesting. Actually, uh, the culture of horses and the buildings built relating to, to horses uh, in England are uh, sometimes at least very impressive, as you can see here. But still white and gray and ah, and I don't expect that you know there were rooms on the first, second floor or the third for the horses. The horse guards. Uh, you would say that this is a palace for the for the queen no? but uh, now it's for the horse guards um, welcome to great britain um uh, yes it's very very gray and uh, somehow after a few centuries the grayness is even more uh, uh, overwhelming the plan of the horse guards quite a large building my god um, in essence, a palace, yes. William Kent, former treasury building on the left. So he designed this building here, also whitish and grayish. I don't really see so much uh, following of Palladio. A gateway on right, clock court in Hampton Court Palace. Now this one is more to my taste. You know, it's a little bit medieval in spirit, and even here is, 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 is and the color, it has color, and it's not just the coat of this person, but also the walls, the bricks. Kensington Palace cupola room, uh, you don't see the cupola here, but you are going to see a little more uh, also in black and white in the next picture. But the walls, as you can see, are, have sculptures and uh, they are uh, ornated. The Kensington Palace cupola room, here it is. Here is the, the peacock's tail at the top. It just came to my mind. Uh, in fact, we, maybe we should end our uh, meeting today with that, uh, in my opinion, a great song by uh, Theodor Kirill, uh, uh, Pederost. Painting ceiling, presence chamber, Kensington Palace. Even here, do you see, do you see what's on that ceiling? Do you design in your projects the ceiling? The ceiling is very important. Yes, to design the ceiling. Even when you have a suspended ceiling, you need some, some kind of design. I know I used to do this when I worked, uh, you know, for uh, office buildings, you know, where you have a suspended ceiling, you have to design the fixtures, the position of the fixtures. In this case, though, they didn't care so much about that. They cared about the the beauty of the ceiling. Why is it we don't make a reflected, reflective ceiling plan, as it is called? Uh, a mur mural and ceiling and a gray staircase in Kensington Palace. Yeah, but this is just a rendering, but uh, you can see the, the splendors and, and, and the richness of everything like, uh, like we saw in Antonio da Sangallo. Westminster Hall with Kent screen in place. It's not very clear to me what, where, where that screen is, but the Westminster Hall is very famous and with a very impressive um, uh, roofing system and the charpent. The carpentry is impressive. Uh, and look at the scale. I mean, you know, these are the human beings and look what's going on here. I guess this is what William Kent did. Uh, not very impressive, actually. I think the room would have looked great, uh, greater without this. Anyway, uh, 
showing Ken's black and white marble floor, a, a nice marble floor here. So he did he did this, uh, and uh, it's very modern actually. And uh, I, I think he played in an interesting way, in a labyrinthical way, uh, with his floor, and uh, it's okay. Rather modern from uh, you know uh, early 18th century. A chapel, Blenheim Palace, Marlboro tomb on the right. He even designed the tomb of or the memorial of, of uh, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, which is not a little thing. Uh, you are going to see it. Here it is, the Sir Isaac Newton's memorial in Westminster Abbey. Uh, yeah. He did this, you know, uh, very elaborate. And uh, yes, Sir Isaac Newton was uh, very important and is very important for, for the culture of, of this country and also for the world. Although Goethe fought with Isaac Newton, Goethe thought that he was born to fight off Isaac Newton. You know why? Because Goethe was against uh, the fact that Newton divided light in seven. And he accused Newton for dividing light just as the church divided God in three or four. Uh, an interesting uh, polemic between, uh, between, um, between uh, Goethe and, uh, and, and, and Newton, actually. The poet, I think, was more right. The scientist was right, too. That's why we have cameras and all the rest. But, but the poet was right, right from a different point of view, because the poet understood the, the interrelatedness of things. Newton was about analysis. The poet, Goethe, was about synthesis. Now, talking about poets, but not about Goethe, this is, uh, he built this, the poet's corner. And I think this is the last image on this short presentation on William Kent uh, in the Westminster Abbey, even with a Shakespeare's memorial. So he did it, William Kent in Westminster Abbey, where various poets are memorialized. Now, I don't know, is this Shakespeare? Uh, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Uh, now I see here something else written. Anyway, there is a, a corner for poets. Maybe we should contemplate such functions ourselves, you know. The, the, uh, sounds good. The poet's corner. Uh, to, to remember them, to, to, to think of them, to feel for them and to memorialize them. Okay, so that's it today.